Good evening, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'll be talking about the link between biology and the environment. Uh, I work professionally as a bioinformatician, but I still very much consider myself an oceanographer at heart. Um, so I'd like to start talking about the Earth's biological engine. And I bet many of you growing up may have heard the phrase that the Amazon forest is the lung of the Earth. And don't get me wrong, the Amazon and other tropical rainforests are precious and they must be protected. But the real lungs of the Earth are the oceans. The oceans are essentially Earth's biological engine and much of its power lies within its tiniest organisms, microbes, particularly pycoplankton, the bacterial and archaeal portion of planktonic organisms. These um, tiny organisms are fundamental to all life on Earth, driving key processes such as carbon cycling and nutrient, uh, nutrient dynamics. So they are driver of global biochemical cycles and phytoplankton alone are responsible for at least half of the planet's primary productivity. So uh, they are the base of the marine food web, uh, supporting larger organisms such as fish and whales. But beyond the role in food webs, phytoplankton also play a crucial role in regulating our climate by absorbing carbon dioxide and um, contributing to global carbon sequestration. Essentially, they are the engines behind many of the biological processes that keep our pl planet ecosystems in balance. As climate change accelerates, understanding how pycoplankton communities are being affected is critical to predicting broader changes in marine ecosystems and in global biogeochemical cycles. And while we often think of life in terms of plants and animals, the reality is that the vast majority of life on Earth is microbial. What's even more remarkable is that much of this microbial diversity remains uncultivated. Uh, we've only scratched the surface of the microbial world. So the unseen majority is what we call these uncultivated microbes, which we can't grow in a lab, but they are, they are thriving in every corner of the planet, particularly in the ocean. Uh, these microbes, including pycoplankton, are key players in Earth's ecosystems, yet most remain poorly understood. However, with advancements in DNA sequencing technologies, we now have a new way to explore this hidden diversity, which is the technique of metagenomics, which allows us to reconstruct microbial genomes without having the need to cultivate them. So metagenomics is a tool uh, that allows us to study the genetic material of entire microbial communities directly from environmental samples, bypassing cultivation. Imagine trying to solve the world's biggest jigsaw puzzle, where the pieces represent millions of DNA fragments, and we're trying to reassemble them into the genomes of the microbes present in the environment. The first step in metagenomics is collecting an environmental sample whether that's from seawater, from sediments, or any other sort of marine environment. Following that, we extract the DNA from all organisms in that sample and prepare it for sequencing, and then perform shotgun sequencing, a method that sequences random fragments of DNA, hence the name uh, jigsaw puzzle. This approach captures the genetic diversity of the entire microbial community. After sequencing, we move on to the bioinformatics stage. This involves de novo assembly, where we piece together the short DNA fragments to reconstruct longer sequences, and metagenomic binning, which groups uh, sequences based on common attributes that they may have. So this allows us to reconstruct genomes and obtain ecological and ev evolutionary insights, such as the previous example of updating the tree of life. Um, we can think of metagenomics and reconstructing these genomes as getting a, a book, as a bucket of seawater, a piece of soil, where each page is a microbial genome that is there. We pass that book through a paper shredder, or our DNA sequencer, which generates uh, millions of tiny pieces. The next step is to assemble these pieces into longer fragments, and then to group uh, these sequences together to try to reconstruct the pages of our book, our genomes. So our work uh, tries to establish a model of global, global pycoplankton biogeography with the tools of metagenomics in hand and to investigate how 
climate change may be influencing that distribution. So first we define um, the, this global model of picoplankton biogeography. Second, we identify the unique taxonomical, the who, and functional, the what, uh, characteristics of these biogeographical provinces, in addition of the environmental makeup that, um, that comprises them. Third, we develop models of high, how picoplankton communities will shift under different climate change scenarios. To achieve these objectives, we compiled a global data set of over 2,000 metagenomes collected from major ocean regions, which are all these dots that we, you can see in the map there. This data set provides us uh, with a vast pool of genetic information, enabling, enabling us to measure sequence level distances between metagenomes and perform hierarchical clustering to group them into biogeographical provinces. We use a machine learning model to project the province areas from our sampling stations to the area of the global oceans and apply the high resolution coverage based method to extract taxonomic and functional profiles from the metagenomes, leveraging a database of over 15,000 genomes reconstructed with the techniques I just covered. Finally, we use multivariate statistical analysis to examine how environmental, climatic, and biological factors differ between these provinces. So our first step was to measure the differences between our samples at the genomic levels. Samples displaying a very degree of connectivity um, represented by the edges that we see in, the, in this figure. We performed a clustering analysis that revealed 10 distinct biogeographic provinces of picoplankton shown here on this dendrogram, and also by the color of the dots shown uh, on the map. This is interesting, but to understand how the biogeography of these organisms may shift under climate change, we want a more detailed um, spatial distribution going beyond only the sampling stations where they were collected. So we trained a machine learning model to predict the type of um, province at each sampling station based on the environmental parameters at each of those dots that you see on the map on the left. But then we fit that model to a global environmental data layer to see how provinces were distributed across the global oceans. Um, and this is what we end up with. We have these 10 uh, distinct biogeographic provinces of picoplankton, each influenced by different environmental drivers. You can see that these provinces follow a latitudinal gradient, but they're also influenced by physical factors such as proximity to coastlines and influence from ocean currents. We have three categories of provinces. The tropical with three provinces that you see in blue, light blue and purple. The polar provinces in dark gray uh, in the Arctic region and in light gray in the Antarctic region. And the temperate provinces show in red, pink, green and yellow. And you can also see the relationship in the clustering uh, dendrogram that we created here. A unique finding from our study was that the Baltic Sea com comprises um, a unique provinces which emerge as an outgroup in our clustering analysis. The picoplankton communities here were distinct from those in other re ocean regions and this is likely due to the Baltic Sea's unique brackish environment. Uh, temperature, oxygen, and neutral co concentration were the primary factors determining the composition of these provinces, but that differed uh, depending on the province. So here on the bottom right, you can see, for example, that in the Baltic Sea, salinity was the most important um, environmental factor to distinguish this province from the others. Uh, so just to clarify, the bars that we are seeing here are the importance of each of the environmental variables that we measured in order to uh, determine and distinguish between those groups. Um, and with this, we established the biology environment, environment link. Our model was able to accurately predict the community composition, that is the province designation of a given geographical coordinate based on environmental data alone. And you can see that by this confusion matrix here, which basically shows 
the true label from our model compare, sorry, the true uh, label of the province compared by the predicted one from our model, and also the ROC curves, which measure model performance. Um, one of the key findings was a polar shift in picoplankton communities consists with patterns observing larger marine organisms. And here, the colored dots are where we expect these distributions to change. So to conclude, we established a high-resolution model of global picoplankton biogeography. Um, we integrated metagenomic and oceanographic data and that provided us with robust predictions of community structure. And establishing this biology environment link, we paved the way for the incorporation of microbial observations into Earth system models. With this, I'd very much like to thank my supervisors, my lab members, and the Royal Society of Victoria for listening to me tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>